Let's turn today to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 3. Let the husband fulfill his duty to his wife, and likewise also the wife to her husband. We were considering in our last study that the Bible speaks very plainly about the physical relationship in marriage and calls it a duty that each partner has towards the other to present their bodies to each other. Because, verse 4, the wife does not have authority over her own body, neither does the husband have authority over his. The other partner also has a right over your body. And therefore, if you do not fulfill this responsibility and duty towards each other, it's a form of cheating. And so it says in verse 5, we are to stop doing that. And the only time when the word of God permits a husband and wife to refrain from this physical relationship is when both agree to fast in this area for the purpose of prayer. Very important to notice here in verse 5 that such separation from each other for a period must be by mutual agreement. Fasting in the area of food concerns only yourself and therefore you are free to fast whenever you feel led to do so. But in the area of the physical relationship in marriage, since it concerns your marriage partner as well, it is not right to fast without the voluntary and joyful consent of both partners in the marriage. This is the word of God, and those who fear God will obey his word. It's a sad thing that many Christians disregard God's word in this area and live as though they have rights over their bodies to do exactly what they like with it. That's contrary to God's word. There is a false asceticism which comes from heathen teaching which leads people to think that there's something unclean in this matter and that to stay away from it is a holy thing. That is a doctrine of a devil according to 1 Timothy 4 and verses 1 to 3. Forbidding marriage and Forbidding the physical relationship is a doctrine of a devil. There's nothing spiritual about it at all. And so, uh, refraining from the physical relationship in marriage must be with mutual consent. And secondly, I want you to notice here in verse 5 what the Word of God says, that it must be only for a time. It must never be for an indefinite period. Only for a specific period of time that both of the partners in a marriage agree to stay away from it for. And also, not in order to become more holy, but so that both partners may devote their time undisturbed to prayer. Or as one translation has it, so that your minds may be free for prayer, so that the mind is undistracted for a particular time and you have a burden for prayer, it's right that husband and wife pray together and that they stay apart from this, perhaps from food as well, if they feel so led, so that they can devote themselves to fasting and prayer. And then after that is over, the Holy Spirit is very careful to state that both partners need to come together again. And the failure very often here is on the part of the wife, because the wife may not feel the necessity as much as the husband. This does not mean that the wife is more spiritual. It just means that God has made the bodies of men and women differently. But the wife particularly needs to take serious heed to the commands given here in verses 3, 4, and 5. That you are to come together again with your partner, the reason being, one reason anyway, lest Satan tempt you because of your lack of self-control. This does not mean that if one is not married or if due to circumstances of separation or illness or something like that, a man cannot have physical relationship with his wife, that therefore he has to sin. Far from it. God's grace is more than sufficient to overcome this temptation. The word of God lays down a standard that we're not even to lust in our thoughts in this area. That's the standard of the new covenant described in Matthew 5 verse 27 onwards. But not all have attained to this life of victory, and so God has made a provision. Let Satan tempt you, lest you are not able to control your fleshly passions and you 
are tempted strongly to sin in the thought life. He's not talking about adultery. Adultery was forbidden even under the old covenant, but in the new covenant, not even in the thought life, should we sin. And therefore, it's nece necessary that husband and wife come together and live as man and wife, resume physical relations again. And it is very important that you do not give room to Satan to unnecessarily harass your partner because of your lack of obedience to God's word in this area. And verse 6, he goes on to speak about the subject of being single or married. And there he's very careful to say that I'm speaking this by way of concession and not as a command. In other words, what he had said earlier in the first five verses are the commands of the Holy Spirit. But now, he says, now what I'm going to say on this particular point, which I'm just about to write on, is something which is a way of concession. You find that Paul is very careful as he writes this chapter to point out what is from the Lord as a command and what is merely a suggestion from him as a mature and wise apostle. And it's very important to distinguish between these two because Paul is very careful to make that distinction and we need to make that distinction too. He says here is something which is a suggestion. I wish, he says, now this is not the command of God, but he says in verse 7, I wish that all men were even as I myself am. Paul was single. And uh, he wished that all men were like himself for the reason which he gives later on in the chapter of being undistracted in order to serve the Lord. Verse 35. For this reason, Paul kept himself single not, for, not to become holy. Far from it. Holiness does not come by a single life. That is a great deception of Satan. Asceticism is not the way to holiness. There's an amazing verse right in the beginning of the Bible which says about Enoch in Genesis 5 verse 22 that Enoch walked with God for 300 years. That's quite a long period of time to walk with God. And it says during those 300 years he had sons and daughters. In other words, he lived a normal married life and he walked with God. He walked with God and had sons and daughters. Is it possible to walk with God and have sons and daughters and live a normal married life according to Genesis 5.22? Yes. According to wrong, ascetic, heathen teaching? No. And it's very important that as Christians we are not influenced by the heathen teaching of asceticism in this area. But Paul says, I wish that people were as I myself am for the purpose of an undistracted devotion to the Lord in his service, particularly since Paul had an itinerant ministry as a full-time Christian worker, he needed to be single. However, he recognizes that each man has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. And that's a very clear statement in the latter part of verse 7, that God has given a special gift in this area. And it's very interesting to see in verse 7, if you read it carefully, that being single is a gift from God. You cannot be single in God's will unless God gives you that gift. It's like the gift of healing, which he speaks of in 1 Corinthians 12. If God doesn't give it to you, you won't have it. Or prophecy, or any other gift. If God gives it to you, you can have it. If he doesn't, you can't have it. And here is one of those gifts, the gift of being single. But further, in verse 7, he says that to be married is also a gift. There are two gifts mentioned in verse 7. One in this manner and another in that. In other words, one person has been given the gift of being single, like Paul, for example, and then he should be single. Another person, like Peter, was given the gift of being married, and so he should be married, like it says in 1 Corinthians 9, 5. In fact, all the apostles except Paul and Barnabas, were married according to 1 Corinthians 9, verse 5. So, there were very few among the apostles who were single. Most of them were married, and that's what is recognized in verse 7. The Holy Spirit inspires Paul to say clearly that even though I wish that every man were single, yet I realize that God has given one gift to one and another gift to another, and each person must be in that particular gift which has been given to him by God. But he says to the unmarried 
and to widows that it is good for them if they remain even as I. And there's nothing wrong in a servant of God giving his own suggestion that if possible, it's good for an unmarried person or a widow to remain single. Of course, he's referring to older widows because in 1 Timothy 5 and verse 11 to 16, particularly 1 Timothy 5.14, he says that younger widows should get married. But otherwise, those who can keep single, he says it's better that they remain single. Again, let me emphasize, so that they can devote themselves to the service of the Lord without earthly distractions. It's very important that we need to understand this in its context. Otherwise, we shall go into wrong teaching that many Christian groups have gone into, unfortunately.